Well, I took up the cross You left for me Took up the cross mm, That set me free From trouble time The victory Took up the cross that set me free. Give or take, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, what else do we have to worry about? Well, there's always those pesky asteroids whizzing by us. Some get a little closer than others, some are a little bigger than others. They say well, if we ever get a really big one, it's just going to crash right through the atmosphere and pulverize planet Earth and we're done. I think they made a movie about that. Like, right? Armageddon? But, uh, so what else? Well, there's all, there's, uh, alien, uh, alien apocalypse, maybe? Aliens? Uh, you might laugh at that, but, you know, we spend taxpayer money to send off things off into space, just looking for life out there, anywhere. Is anybody out there? They, they have these time capsules, you know, that they send off, and there's probably one out there right now zooming by uh, Jupiter or something, probably playing an Elvis song or something out there <laughs> to see if anything or anybody answers back. You know, there's a lot of people out there that believe in some of these scenarios that it may that it could happen and they're worried and they're concerned and they talk about things like what we just said asteroids and, and what's going to happen to planet earth I can tell you about all these scenarios and I can tell you about the people that might believe in them they have one thing in common they're all wrong <laughs> they're all wrong and the reason they're wrong is because I either they have forgotten God completely, or they may say they believe in God, but God does not figure into their thinking or their daily lives or anything, and so really, they're practicing atheists. So, they have this, um, this idea that, you know, if, if we, we need to save the planet. Have you heard that term much lately? Save the planet? Yeah. Who's it up to? Oh, well, they say it's up to us. We have to save the planet from ourselves because, after all, if we don't save the planet, who's, who is? Oh, God? What God? See, they don't, they don't acknowledge God in their thinking. And in the book of Romans, chapter 1, it talks about this digression from the point where they did know God, but they didn't honor him as God. When they knew, there was a time when everyone knew God. But they became vain in their thinking. They didn't honor God as being God. And it says their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They're fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And there's a lot of smart fools out there. I don't know what else you could call them. They're intelligent people. They're scientists. They're thinkers. They're professors. They but they do not acknowledge God in any of their, any of their thinking, their, their belief system. And so here we are, we're just by ourselves. So we have to save the planet ourselves. Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was a famous astronomer and a very devout atheist and very antagonistic towards Christianity, God, and the Bible. And he had a quote, one of his quotes, Carl the Pagan Sagan, we used to call him. But one of his quotes was, all there ever was, all there is, and all there ever will be is the cosmos. That's it. There's just the cosmos. So think about that for a second. That's all there is. Well, just suppose... One of those asteroids does break through the atmosphere and 
that's the end of planet Earth. Well, according to him and those who think like him, the Earth and everything in it, everyone in it, will have existed for absolutely no purpose. No reason other than just the fact that it came into existence by some uh, chance arrangement of, of atoms and then it went out of existence by some chance arrangement of atoms. Kind of makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, aren't you glad you know the Lord? Aren't you glad that God is a personal God? There's reason. There's reason. There's, there's hope. There's structure. There's, there's order. And he's in charge. He's in charge. He hasn't left us to ourselves, our own devices. So... You know, we, we long for that day when God is going to make everything correct again, everything right, the redemption of our souls, the redemption of our bodies. And we just sang a song, all of creation longs to be delivered. Did you know that? We long to be delivered, and so does planet Earth. Planet Earth, the creation, longs to be delivered because it suffered the effects of the curse too. You know, sin... Uh, Sin has left its mark on us, but, but it's left its mark on creation, too. Well, we got hurricanes, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know who, who thinks hurricanes are a good thing. I mean, not after Michael tore through uh, the, uh, the panhandle up there. So the creation groans, longs to be delivered. Um, so we know that's going to happen someday. In the meantime, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking care of the planet that we live on. There's nothing, you know, to, wrong with showing a little bit of stewardship, you know. Um, I know in Genesis 1, he's, God said to Adam to subdue the earth. Okay, I don't think by subduing, I don't think he meant to, to, pull, to, to uh, beat it into oblivion, you know, or to trash the planet. So I think we can be good stewards in taking care of what God has given us in the meantime. Uh, you know, you, I, I see things around me that just things are living in South Florida, things that are just going away. Um, you know, I'm into, uh, I'm into nature, and maybe some of you are too. You guys go out and, and hunt, and you're out there. I'm looking at birds and stuff. You know, in South Florida or Florida or the, or the East Coast, we have blue jays. Everybody's probably seen a blue jay. A lot west, west, you know, California, west of the Rockies, they don't really have blue jays out there. They have another word, a bird called a Stellar's. J. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Named after a guy named Stellar, of course. But Stellar's Jays, they're, they're, they're pretty cool too. But St Stellar had another animal named for him too that you probably haven't heard of at all called Stellar's Sea Cow. Anybody heard of Stellar's Sea Cow? It was about 30 feet long. And it lived up around the Bering Strait. Stellar was a naturalist and an explorer. And he went up, uh, up into Canada and up into... Uh, Alaska, the Bering Sea, and all that. And he discovered this uh, stellar sea cow. And he published his reports, and he said it was, it was good for meat, and they used the oil for this and that. And that. Well, guess what? It was extinct 30, it got over 100. 30, 30 years later, it's extinct. 30 years after it was discovered, it was gone. Just because of, you know, how they, how they overhunted it. You know, and I guess, yeah, it was good for oil and food and this and that, and it, I guess it provided a need for them, but, but to wipe out a species, you know, in that amount of time. So, you know, we can take maybe a little better care of the planet. I think we've wised up a little bit since then. But, um, you know, I mean, don't get me going on, on, on this, because I, uh, you know, I'll spare you the story of uh, Dusky the Seaside Sparrow, okay? I'll tell you him uh, so another time, another bird that was right here in Florida. Only place in the world it was, it was in Florida. That's the only place you could find it. And it went extinct, of course, you know, development. Last little holdout was up by Cape Canaveral. Unfortunately, they needed that land to build roads and runways and this and that, I guess. And uh, said, well, you know, if you build that road, it's gone, you know. I said, well, we need the road. So they built the road and it's, it's gone. Anyway, so, uh, but... Um, 
But God sustains it. You know, I, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, when I'm out looking for birds, I mean, I'm glad a T-Rex hasn't, you know, come up on me. So, I mean, some extinctions maybe are okay, you know. But, uh, but you know, but God not only created this planet, but he sustains it. He's not just a creator, he's the sustainer. Let's look at um, just a couple of verses in Colossians. I'm going to be flipping back and forth a little bit, and I didn't want, really mark my Bible anywhere, so it's going to take me a while to flip through. But in Colossians, chapter 1, uh, in 15 through 7, 17, this is speaking of Christ as the creator. <clears throat> Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's holding this universe together by the power of his word. That's what it says uh, in Hebrews. He upholds all things by the word of his power. In other words, he's got the whole world in his hands. And as long as he's got the whole world in his hands, no asteroids, you know, none of that stuff is going to happen until, um, until God takes action. So it's not going to end with, with asteroids or, or, or some nuclear winter or if we blow ourselves up. It's not going to happen. Yeah, the world's not going to end because of global warming. Okay? There's maybe... Yeah, maybe toward the end there's going to be some serious global warming, but that's, that's down the road. <laughs> but um, you see, Christians are privy to this stuff, and the world does not get it. They can look at this book, they can read it, they can, they can read the same words that we read, but they're not going to get it because God has hid it from them. It says... Um, the natural man, in uh, Corinthians, it says, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. It says, that he, for they are foolishness with him, and he cannot understand them. True believers who have the Spirit of God living inside of them can have the discernment to understand what this is talking about. But unbelievers, they, will, they do not get it, they will not get it, even though um, now, even though God is his, when we look at prophecy, they say you can't. Well, you can't prove the Bible. And people read the Bible, and you ask people uh, uh, who have read the Bible, "Well, I read it, and I kind of read it, and I didn't get anything out of it." All right, or I read it, I, it's just too much for me. I don't know. Or I don't believe it. You know, but when you look at prophecy, I mean, it, it's a clear proof for for God's word. That it's true. And just, just a few little things, Old Testament prophecies, just to remind us. Just to remind us. But, um, because see, God has told us ahead of time what's going to happen with us and with the planet. He's told us already ahead of time. We know. You look at, at like in the, in the book of Daniel, where like chap chapter in chapter 9 of Daniel, he lays out the whole scenario for the nation of Israel from that time to the end, to the complete end. Exactly. Other prophecies, you know, the prophecies concerning, concerning Christ. Detailed prophecies of when Christ was going to be born, where Christ was going to be born. And, you know, one thing that somebody may mention a few weeks ago, but, but Sir Robert Anderson did a study from one of those prophecies, or it said from, from Daniel uh, chapter 9, the 70 weeks, from, from it's, uh, 483 years, to Messiah the Prince. Well, we know the date that that started at, because it started with a decree uh, to rebuild the temple. They know the date that started. And all he did is he counted the, he counted the days. From that point, and he counted, 483 years. He had to account for you know, leap years and, and a different calendar and all that. Well, guess where he came up to when he came up to the end of the last day? What happened on that day? Until Messiah the Prince. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. The only day 
that that could have fulfilled that prophecy. Right down to the day. Um, you know, in, prophet, in, in New Testament prophecies, that Jesus himself, Jesus foretold the destruction of the temple. And he didn't even say the temple is going to be destroyed. He said, no, one stone is going to be left upon another. That's exactly what happened. Not one stone was left upon another when it was destroyed in 70 AD. It's exactly how it happened. I think for some reason they were looking for gold or something when they, you know, they thought something was in the gold, was in the stone. So, so they took it apart block by block. My, you know, just, just minute prophecies fulfilled. I think God means what he says. We don't need to get too, too symbolic or far out there because you look at these prophecies, how, they're, how they've been fulfilled. And we can look at what's going to happen in that same prophetic light. And we don't have all the details. And we don't have the time. We don't know exactly when. It doesn't say so. If it don't say, then we don't say. Or we shouldn't. I, I've, I've always said they ought, to, they ought to set up some organization, Date Setters Anonymous, you know, where they could just go to meetings and, and get over it or something. <laughs> you know, because it, it does the body of Christ a disservice when a pastor can stand up there and predict when Jesus, Jesus is coming back. They write books on it. Guys on the Larry King show. Well, it's going to happen in uh, 1994, according to this guy here. And, and then he asked him, he says, he says, well, what if Jesus doesn't come back then? Does that mean the Bible's wrong? <coughs> oh, well, well, you know, I guess maybe he'll just write another book <laughs> with another date on it. But, you know, they, but, but things like that, they can cause unbelievers to blaspheme the name of God. He says, huh, you said this, didn't happen. So we don't have a date. You know, there's even prophecy in between the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have those, inner, those, those years in between, about 400 years. They, we, we call them the silent years. Or some people call them the silent years. Because there was no prophet from God. There was no revelation given during that time, from the time the Old Testament was completed and the time of uh, Christ in the New Testament. But they're really not silent years at all. Those interview, uh, if you read Jan, Daniel chapter 11, there's prophecies that cover those years. You can read all about it in chapter 11 of Daniel. The exploits of Alexander the Great and the, his kingdom coming to an end and being split up among his four generals. And, and it's, it, it's, this is detailed prophecy, and it's so, it's so correct and detailed that, that skeptics of the Bible, the only thing they can say is, well, it, could, it, just, it just couldn't have been written then. And, it, of course, it was. It was already written. It was already down. The, the Septuagint, the Greek uh, New Testament, it was translated by 300 A.D. and they started translating. You know, it was already in, in, down on paper before it happened. So what's in store for planet Earth? Now we looked at all this prophecy, and we have prophecy looking forward that hasn't happened yet. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to the planet? I can tell you... The long-term prognosis looks very good, okay? In the end, you, want, you like reading the end of the, the story to, to see how it ends. Just read uh, Revelation 21 and 22. New heaven, new earth, and <laughs> descriptions of a, of a city that just, it just blows our minds because we, it's just like nothing that we've, we can experience here. Uh, just, you know, gates being, a, you know, precious streets of gold. I mean, right there. I mean, streets of gold. That's a lot of gold. Maybe it's just gold plated or something. Uh, no, I think it's, it says it's pure gold. Transparent, like glass. So, what about before then? Well, there's, a, there's some tough times ahead of us. And uh, we call these the last days. I think we're in the last days. Problem is, is how long are the last? Are we at the last days of the last days, or the beginning of the last, or the middle of the last days, or, or when did it start and when does it end? Well, it ends when Christ comes back. Um, but um, let me uh, 
read some of what's going to happen ahead of us. Because I, I, I think that God can still do what he wants. You know, second, I know like Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and seek, and seek my face, right? he will hear from heaven and heal their land. I think God can do that. And I, I pray that he does that. I pray to that end. I don't pray for tribulation. Um, but think about it. There's tribulation al already. I mean, right now, there's more martyrs for, for Christ in this century than, than the previous centuries. So it's like because it hasn't touched us here, I mean, don't, don't think the world is, is just a, still a lovely place for Christians. They're being, they're being slaughtered. No other, yeah. <laughs> No other way to say it. So, um, let me get my pages. I think I got them all mixed up. The characteristics of what's going to happen are, are laid out in various scriptures in Second Peter. Uh, let, I'm going to go to Second Peter because I want to read that. I think I just wrote it down, but without the. This is the global warming, I think, that I alluded to. It says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. This is uh, 2 Peter 3, starting in 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. So that's going to happen. Interesting word where it says roar. Uh, I don't, it doesn't translate very well, but it has the idea of this, of a crackling sound, like a, like a whoosh. That's how it actually translates, just a, and it's, and it's gone. So that's what awaits planet Earth at the end, at the end. Before then, there could be some tough times ahead for us. He says, again, in the last days, difficult times will come. Look at the characteristics of people at this time. You tell me if we're there or we're getting there or we're not there at all. But I'll tell you, no one has ever come up to me and said, Don, you know, I really think we must be in the last days because people are just so nice to each other now. They're not so not nicer than they used to be, you know. We must be in the last days. No one's ever said that to me during my Christian life. It's things are, are not getting better. Realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, Haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And look at first look at verse thirteen. Evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. I'll give you another prophecy, and it's from Matthew twenty four. That Jesus gave and uh, I think we tend to overlook this one a little bit because we're concerned with signs in heaven and this and that. But in Matthew 24, Jesus says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And that's what we have to be careful about. If we see lawlessness abounding around us, we can't let, that, let, let our love grow colder because of what we see around us. Does anybody grit your... Do you grit your teeth once in a while like I do when I see what people are doing to each other? These, you know, massacres? Does anybody like, like me want to be the judge just for five minutes? You know, and we can't do, you know, we just, we can't go there. You know, God is the judge. He's in control. We have to just let God be God on that. And we can't let our love grow cold because of what we see like that. So... <clears throat> 
I'm going to just share a final thought. This has just been bouncing around in my brain for a while. I don't think I shared it with anybody. But, and, you can, and you can disagree with me on any of this. You know, If things get better, if God gives us a reprieve, hallelujah, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm right there, you know. But let me, not too long ago, I read a book on the sinking of the Lusitania. Now, the Lusitania was an, was an ocean liner, <clears throat> big ocean liner. It was sunk by a German torpedo um, before the U.S. got into um, World War I. But it was sailing from New York to Liverpool. A couple of things I found fascinating was, first of all, Everybody that got on that boat knew what could happen. They, weren't, they, they didn't go on there just, just totally ignorant of, of what was going on around them. They knew. The German embassy had taken out an ad in the New York newspapers right next to the ad for the Lusitania. And it said, warning, passengers on Lusitania, you, you will be sailing into wartime waters, you will be, may be subject to, to wartime, this and that, you know. And it was right there in black and white. So when they got on that boat, they knew what could happen, but they kind of just said, you know, ah, you know, the Lusitania, it's, it's a big ship, you know, the Germans would never do that, and it, you know, it couldn't happen. So they went on their way, and they got on the boat. I think only a couple of people might, might have just actually taken heed and, and not sailed. But, um, and there's like 1,200 people that died when it was sunk. And just to give you an, an idea by contrast, the Titanic, when it, when it um, went down in the North Atlantic, it took over two hours for the Titanic to go down. The Lusitania sank in 18 minutes. So they were on their last day of the journey, and um, it was a beautiful day. Morning, blue skies, and the Lusitania was sailing right by the Irish coast. Fairly close. If you could have looked, if you were on the beach or something there on, on the south of Ireland, you would have looked out and you would have seen the ship. And uh, because of that, a lot of the, the, uh, the passengers, they were all along the, uh, the deck there on the railing, and they were all look, look, looking out at the, uh, at the Irish coast. And then somebody yelled out, torpedo. Here comes the torpedo. And what's very strange, I, I thought, nobody, this is according to survivors, nobody screamed and ran and, and, and panicked and this and that. It was like the moment had come and they, they just, I don't know if it was denial or, or what, but they just, they watched it. They just watched it. And they had about 35 seconds or something like that from the time it was spotted. And they just all watched it until it disappeared, you know, from their view below the decks. And then, of course, the explosion. Then the panic. I wonder sometimes if there's a torpedo heading our way. I just wonder. Um, one of Billy Graham's, I think it was Billy Graham, that said, you know, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yeah. Billy, I think Billy Graham said that. Some could say we're maybe under some judgment already. That's what we're experiencing it. But if there's something heading our way in the for and, and something that's just going to, you know, big... One thing we shouldn't do is we shouldn't be just standing watching it coming. You know, I think we really just need to get busy about the Lord's business. I've been just, you, you can't get away from this news. I mean, you can say, I don't watch the news, but, you know, we, we know what's going on. And, uh, you know, things are, you know, we have nothing to fear as far as, as, far as what, what, what God is, is going to do. But... We need to be ready, I think, maybe to just to brace for impact for maybe what, what could, could be coming our way in the form of, you know, we say persecution. And, and I know there are people around the country that have, that have, 
had things happen to them because of their Christian faith. But nothing, nothing like what's going on in other parts of the world. Nothing like it. So if there's some changes coming, and I hope they don't, I hope God gives us a reprieve, and he could. Um, you know, we, we, we need to put our faith in God, not, not getting this guy into office or that guy into office, you know. I'm not saying don't be involved, you know, and, 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 and don't vote, you know. Go ahead and vote, you know, Tuesday and this and that. But uh, I look at the, where the culture is at, and I, I think culture trumps politics. Politics kind of just kind of follows along behind. So, uh, but anyway, nevertheless, those who know Christ have a home in heaven. This isn't our home. If you want to go step on the grass, go ahead. You go step on the grass. You know, or you want to go shoot a deer, Collins? You go shoot a deer. It's o It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> So uh, anyway, the band's going to come up, and uh, we're going we're gonna to do a song. But, you know, don't, don't think that, that the planet is going gonna, is gonna to save your soul. We've got a very short time on this earth, very short time. If you haven't dealt with your soul, with salvation, with sin. Do it now. Don't, you know, don't, don't wait. The world's not going to end until God says it's going to end. But we, don't, we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow to us. So take care of that. Well, I took up the cross. You left for me. Took up the cross mm, that set me free from troubled times. The victory took up the cross that set me free.